All right, Shabbat Shalom. It's good to see everybody online. Blessings to you. Blessings to everyone that's here. Jonathan, if you'll come up, please, sir, and get us started with prayer. We'll get jump right into this. Yes, sir. All right, let's pray. Do you love me for this day? Thank you for your Sabbath. Thank you for the time, effort, energy, and um, call from Pastor Joe to listen and hear and pay attention to what you have for him, um, ultimately to bring to us. I pray these your words that we hear today um, through your servant and that we have open minds and open hearts to receive the message that you've given him. And I just pray that you give him boldness and zeal to say exactly mm -hmm. what he's supposed to say, the best way that he's supposed to say it, and in a way that's most impactful to all those who uh, listen to this today and into the future. I pray over him and his family and everybody else's family that uh, is represented from the vine and from the people watching online and to keep us safe and to help us to endure to the end and to give us the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for your Sabbath day. It's such a good day. It's a blessing day. A day you told us to come together, be together, and honor and serve you. Keep this day holy and set apart. Pray things in your son's holy name, Yeshua. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Shabbat Shalom to everybody. As we round out this beautiful Shabbat day in South Carolina, a little bit cooler weather has come in, but it's me. I'm a big bear, so I love it. Brothers who are in my front living room that right now that are wearing jackets. <laughs> Sorry, this is the way I live. <laughs> so again, welcome. We're glad you're here. And uh, if you miss it today, don't miss any more. Come on, uh, join us every uh, Sabbath at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to uh, join us for Anchor to Truth. Uh, we are we just completed uh, Chapter 44 of the Book of Jubilees and looking forward to doing Chapter 45 here soon. And I enjoyed the the camaraderie and just uh, speaking with everybody online. It's awesome. This is my and the same as here. We, we enjoy having everybody with us on Sabbath all day long. Shabbat Shalom there, uh, Jeremy Pierce, Marsha uh fariba i hope i'm saying that right i apologize if i'm not hello from alabama awesome very good good to have everybody on with us and uh, also if you'd like to visit our website it's called divine.community uh you can check it out you can make an account if you like one of our admins will get you going on that you can also uh, if you'd like to partner with us and give to the vine we really really would appreciate that <laughs> and uh, you can go on, there's a couple different ways you can give but also uh, we are just blessed that you're here with us. If you have any prayer requests or anything like that, please send it to us and uh, send it to me in an email. We'll make sure we get you pray over. Um, as well as we keep uh, all the feast dates, uh, sermons, and everything else on there. So if you haven't checked it out, please give it a look. All right, guys, get started today. We're going to be talking about part two of the case for the biblical Sabbath. It says, Well, the Sabbath nailed to the cross. Now, typically, when we get to a, a particular subject like this, a lot of times this has to deal with the law, the instructions that were given uh, to Moshe from the Father. So let's be clear about that. What's wrong? Oh, okay. Um, so we normally, when we when we're discussing what was nailed to the cross, it's not typically just speaking of the Sabbath. It's just say, hey, by the way. All of it. Don't worry about it. Shrimp's back on the Barbie baby. You can eat, you know, eat whatever you like, do whatever you want, keep whatever day you like, you know, all these good things. Well, if you missed part one, I, I encourage you to go back and listen to part one on that because there was some, uh, I went over some uh, scriptures that people usually use as their case of saying, oh, well, see, Yeshua is now, he's now the master. He's the, he is our Sabbath rest. And therefore we don't have to keep the traditional Seven day Sabbath, and guess what? It is traditional, but it's not man's tradition, it's God's, it's our Heavenly Father's tradition to keep the seventh day Sabbath. And I think the breakdown I did last Shabbat on this, I encourage you to go back and listen to it because where those arguments come, in, I think we can clearly see with scripture so far for the case that we're presenting that the Son Yeshua did never, he never did away with his Father's commandments, and he never did, especially, never did away. With the weekly Sabbath. Amen. Amen. So let's keep going. Oop. It'll help if I bring this back up. There we go. So the biblical basis for the Sabbath. Let's read this. We, I read this last week. Let's read again. The Sabbath originates at creation as God rested on the seventh day after working six days. Uh, Genesis 2, 2 through 3. The fourth commandment given to Moshe also establishes the seventh day as a day of rest and remembrance 
That's important. This isn't just a day, Jonathan, me and you talked about this, where this isn't, and look, if you're in your PJs right now and you're watching us, hey, we're not condemning you for being in your PJs. <laughs> or relaxing on the Sabbath or taking a long nap on the Sabbath or anything like that. But I think it's, it's very important to remember the importance of the Sabbath and what it should mean to all of us. Amen. It shouldn't be just a day that we get lazy and do whatever and just lay around the house all day. I think it's called, it's a time of call to fellowship, whether it's in person or online. I know a lot of you that watch us online, unfortunately, you don't have fellowships that you can go to immediately uh, or something happened and you can't be in fellowship, whatever that might be. But I do believe that on the Sabbath, it's good for the children to come together. It's good for us to read scripture together because what does it do? It brings remembrance. Everything we read today brought back remembrance of what the Father has done for us. It brought back remembrance of the promises of the commandments. It brought back remembrance of, hey, Abraham, uh, by the way, I'm blessing you. Look to the left, to the right. It's all yours. By the time we get to Jacob, we hear that same language today. We get we get to see that the Father speaks to Jacob in the Torah portion. They go, hey, by the way, I haven't forgot about you. By the way, I'm going to bless you. By the way, the nations are going to be blessed by you as well. So it's good that we read these things. We read out of John today, John chapter 7. You know, we, when, when everyone was marveling about what Yeshua did, and they were like, oh, my gosh. He didn't, he didn't go to the Ivy League colleges. He didn't train under Gamaliel and all these other rabbi-type people. He didn't do it. How is he speaking under this authority? And what's good about reading these scriptures is you realize they just weren't up to par with Yeshua. They weren't. The reason why a lot of them marveled and were amazed is because they haven't heard it, even though this is a time of Sukkot. And during the time of Sukkot, it meant all the teachers were there. All the Pharisees were there. All the Sadducees are there. All the people of you know clout are there. And all the people, I think, are going, you know what? I've never heard Isaiah read quite that way and explained before. And so they're marveling over this. So this is these are times where we come together on, on the Sabbath to uh, not only bless one another, but to bless our Heavenly Father. This is the day that our Heavenly Father says, I'm going to show up regardless. I'm going to be there, and I want my kids there with me. And guess what? I want my kids together as much as they can be together. I want them together and sharing this time. So it's a day of remembrance of God's creative work. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, the seventh day honored as a sacred day, a sign between God and his people. I talked about this last week. It's like the wedding ring, guys, right? I try not to ever leave my house without my rings on. Matter of fact, if my wife, if she leaves this house to go somewhere, she immediately calls me, Joe, I feel naked right now. You're not, right? No, you're not naked right now. <laughs> okay, we're good. <laughs> now, I'm not naked, but I don't have my rings on. I feel naked because this is a sign of the covenant between me and my wife. And when we're out in public and someone sees this on there, it's like, oh, this person's in covenant. They're not available is what it's saying. <laughs> and so that's the way it should be to all the other nations and all the other pagan gods and everything out there that when they see us wearing the covenant, in our lives, we're not available for you. We're only available to him. And there won't be any mixing or anything else going on. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it says, oh, let's pick it back up. It says there are over 60 references to the Sabbath in the New Testament, indicating it was still kept by Yeshua's followers after his death and resurrection. Amen. There's an abundance of scripture to saying they, they didn't stop. They didn't get together and have a meeting and go, hey, guess what? Jesus is gone. What are we going to do now? Now he's done abolished everything, and these guys are over there eating pig and, and seafood like crazy, and, you know, the feast days are out the window. I guess we don't have to save for Sukkot no more. I guess everything's gone. No, it was business as usual. <laughs> there was nothing that changed. Matter of fact, something did change, though, because now the Holy Spirit's being poured out like crazy on those who are believing. Because as soon as he had sent it to the Father, he said, I'm sending the one to you. Jesus made a promise to them. He made a promise to all of us. He says, I'm going to the Father, but I'm going to send the Comforter to you. And surely he did, because it surely showed up. <laughs> the Holy Spirit shows up at Pentecost and 3,000 people like that. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's through obedience, by the way. So let's go into this. So the big question is, well, Pastor Joe, what was nailed to the cross in Colossians 2.14? Thank you for asking, okay? 
and I may be destroying this word. I don't know. We've looked, I've looked over it so many different times, but it, I've heard the huh, I've heard the gra, and I've heard all kinds of different ways. But I think the easiest way for me to say is I'm gonna say k. k. It actually, I looked up on YouTube. There's like different ways of saying it, but gonna, for me, it's gonna be k k rografun. And so k rografun. Let's talk about it. So what is that? I've never heard of that before. Well, today you're going to learn what Kyogrophon is, and you're going to realize not only was the Sabbath not nailed to the cross on that day, neither was the law or any of the ordinances of our Heavenly Father were nailed to the cross on that day. Let's go into it. So the term Kyogrophon is a Greek word used in the New Testament, particularly in Colossians 2.14. It means handwriting or a written record. In ancient times, a kyogrophon was a handwritten document often used as legal or financial instrument, uh, uh, instrument, yeah, such as a certificate of debt or a bond. Just think about that for a second. So what I'm going to do is this is, uh, I'm going to read a, a small portion of, uh, this is from Daniel Botkin. He's a teacher, uh, I think also the founder of Gates of Eden. And I've got his website right there uh, for you if you want to go back and look at the full transcript of what he's saying. But I want to give credit where credit is due, uh, where he's put in the research and the time enough for this. Because before him, I have never heard this word before or the explanation of what was nailed to the cross. Because when we go back to the writings of Paul in Romans, a lot of people say, well, see, it said the law of this is done away with, the law is done away. And it's like, no. By the way, I, I, let me just say this. Uh, if you're familiar with 119 Ministries, or you're not, so it's literally 119 Ministries, they do a great series on the Pauline Paradox. And I highly recommend you go in there and listen to their teachings on the Pauline Paradox or any teachings on whether or not the law of Jehovah was done away with. And they do a great job. I don't feel like I have to go and re reinvent the wheel on that. They do a superb job of going into Romans and actually breaking down all the different laws that were being talked about, and none of them were the Torah. By the way, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you <laughs> straight up, it was never the Torah. But it's 119 ministry, I believe it's called the Pauline Paradox. Go and check it out. And whatever else they have on that subject, it's really good. It breaks it down for you, gives us more insight into what Paul is saying, because as Peter says, those who have unlearned will twist the, 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 the writings or the sayings of Paul. Those, well, see, actually, my, my, in the, two, in the scriptures version, it says those who are ignorant, aka those who are dumb, are going to do dumb things and they're going to twist the words of Paul. And unfortunately, I don't mean it in a mean way, but unfortunately, that's happened a lot throughout the history of the church body where the writings of Paul have been twisted. Where now the enemy is, I, I believe it was all 100% the enemy coming in and, and saying, you know what? How much more can I profane the name of God? How much more can I just take away from him? How much more can I just do as much destruction to the body as possible? And this has been one of the bigger of the destructions of the body of Messiah is that he just did away with all of it. Don't worry about it. And everybody's living on free grace. It's like having free energy every day. Oh, no more light bill. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I can run to heat and air all I want to. Uh, no, it's not like that. Okay, <laughs> It's not like that at all. So let's continue. Let's go to Mr. Daniel. Since many Christians erroneously believe that the handwriting of ordinances, Kyogrophon, Tolus Dogmason, in Colossians 2.14 refers to the Old Testament law of Moshe. According to this misinterpretation, God's law was against us and contrary to us because it was a heavy yoke of bondage. Man, gotta get rid of that. It was an impediment or a hindrance to man's attempt to be reconciled to Yahuwah. Therefore, Yahuwah had to take it out of the way. He's like, hey, this is too much for everybody. Guess what, guys? Don't worry about it. When I get to the cross, done away with it. Forget about it. He says, and get rid of it. He's, and he did this by nailing it to the cross. In other words, we are reconciled to Yahuwah by Yahshua's abol uh, ab abolition of his father's law, so says his popular misinterpretation of Colossians 2.14. Let me make sure that there's going to be some stuff in there. I might have to... Let's keep reading. This says, this view is flawed for a few different reasons. First, it contradicts the biblical truth that Yahuwah's law, properly understood, is neither... Now get this. It's neither against us nor contrary to us. 
According to the Bible, God's unadulterated law is a blessing, not a burden. I'm going to leave this up just for a second for you so that you can, uh, if you want to uh, screenshot any of the verses there, if you're studying this out and you're like, man, I don't even know what you're talking about yet. And guess what? By the end of this teaching, I hope you understand uh, what's being say, said, what's being laid down. And it's going to be a, uh, plenty of scriptural references to back all this up. Amen. Here we go. Country kid, Shalom. I just saw you pop up on the screen. All right, here we go. It says, a second reason this view is flawed is because it portrays Yeshua as a slick lawyer who finds a legal loophole to thwart Yahuwah's justice. Uh, Yeshua gets us off the hook by simply abolishing the commandments that we broke. Hey, don't worry about it. You've been accused of breaking the Sabbath. No problem. I'll just abolish that commandment. <laughs> but Yeshua, uh, excuse me. But Yeshua said we are uh, not to even think that he came to abolish the law in Matthew 5, 17 through 19. A third reason this view is flawed is because of the meaning of that long word, Kerophon. A study of this word will reveal exactly what it was that got nailed to the cross in Colossians 2, 14. When you see what really got nailed to the cross, you will find it far more liberating than believing that Yeshua blotted out his father's commandments. The Greek word kreographon is a compound word that is formed by combining the two words uh, care, hand, and gra uh, grapo, or grapo to write or engrave. In its simplest sense, the word means a handwritten document. Simple as that, even though it's a hard word to read. <laughs> Other than in Colossians 2.14, the word kreographon appears nowhere else in the Greek New Testament, nor does it appear anywhere in the Septu Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. However, the word does appear in extra-biblical Greek documents. It is these documents that we learn that kreographon is a legal term. It is a word uh, that was used to refer to the written evidence of a person's guilt in a courtroom. So we're kind of forming a little bit of picture here, right? So from here on out, I want you to kind of be thinking more of a courtroom situation. Um, and, and in this courtroom, you're going to have Hasatan, the accuser, right? And uh, <laughs> it's got a time <laughs> in between. You got Hasatan, the accusers there in the courtroom. We got the guilty person in the middle. And just imagine Yeshua's on the other side. And in Hasatan's hand, he's holding everything you've ever done. Now, some of you may be a lot thicker than this few pieces of paper. <laughs> he may have, it may be like some of those court cases you see on television where they come in with the big uh, legal bo boxes of binders and they're like putting them down. He's like, man, I got a U-Haul full on this guy. You know, we, we got him. There is no way I'm losing this one. Sorry, Satan, not today. So anyway, let's continue. Excuse me. This is the one I had to. I'm sorry. Some of these are going to be it did, it did to some of my slides too. I didn't realize it, it stretched them out. It is a written record uh, on a person's crimes, the laws he has broken, and the penalty he owes for his law breaking. In ancient times, the accuser would present the kerogaphon from the middle of the courtroom called the Tal Meso, the middle, which means the middle. The exact same term, Paul. Uh, Paul uses when he says the choreographer is taken out of the way, Tal Mesu. So let me read that again. It says the same term Paul uses when he says the choreographer is taken out of the way. Because choreographer and Tal Mesu are legal terms, you must think of the choreographer in a legal context to understand its meaning and to appreciate the significance of Paul's statement in Colossians 2.14. You must picture yourself in the context of the heavenly courtroom. That's what I just said a minute ago. God is, in the pre God is the presiding judge. You have been arrested and brought into the courtroom of God. You stand accused of breaking God's laws. Not a good day. In God's courtroom, there is a prosecuting attorney, Satan, the adversary, the accuser of the brethren. In his hands, the adversary holds a choreographer and a legal written document. It is a written record of every sin you have ever committed. 
Can you imagine the guilt on that, uh, the feeling of that, like seeing that? It's like it is a detailed account of every time you broke God's law. The Creole Fund lists the dates, the times, and the locations, the testimony of witnesses, and all the other details of your law breaking. So this is a full, this is like, hey, from A to Z, I got you. I own you. You are mine. I've gotten every piece of evidence on you. None of it is inflated. None of it is made up. It's 100% the truth. We need to understand that, that when the, the, the adversary brings judgment against you, he's not making anything up. He's actually bringing what is the truth about what you have done that broke God's commandments. Oops. There we go. The information on the written document is not based on hearsay or unfounded suspicion. It is recognized by the court as a legal and legitimate document. The adversary holds in his hands the indisputable proof of your guilt, along with the penalties that are that the court prescribes for such crimes, and he presents the choreographer to the judge. So he already knows, hey, guilty, 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 and guilty. Fortunately, you have an advocate with you in the courtroom of Yahuwah. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahushua, the righteous. Hallelujah. 1 John 2, 1. Your advocate does not deny the truth of the charges brought against you. We have to understand this. You know, a lot of times when we see a courtroom case on TV, and I do love a good drama sometimes. I love back in the day. I'm old enough to tell you this. Some of you are old enough. A lot of remember Perry Mason, the original Perry Mason, by the way. And, you know, uh, what was the one with uh, Andy Griffin? Matlock. Oh, at least loves Matlock now. He just, oh, is there? Oh, okay. And so I used to love that. But here's the, here's the deal. The guy who's representing you, you could be guilty, but he just may be a really good representative and get you off the hook. What this is saying is, no, you are guilty. You're dead to rights, man. You You messed up. You done messed up, Ron. That ain't good, okay? It says, so your advocate does not deny the truth of the charges brought against you. Your advocate admits that the information on the care fund is true. You have indeed committed all these crimes, and you uh, do indeed deserve the penalty, which is prescribed on the care fund. Oops, I think he's double jumping on me. There we go. However, and I love that word sometimes. Sometimes it's that sometimes it doesn't work out for you. The however or the buts. But. <laughs> but this time the however actually works out in our favor. It says, however, your advocate, which is Yeshua, says the penalty for all your crimes has already been fully paid. Your advocate paid the penalty himself when he went to the cross and took upon himself the sins of the world and bore the punishment for your sins. Hallelujah and amen. Because without it, we're dead. Without this, in the courtroom of the heavenly courts, we are guilty and we and there will be a judgment placed upon you according to what you have done. Because the penalty has already been fully paid, the judge tells Satan that his choreographer is inadmissible evidence. Excuse me in the heavenly courtroom. Therefore, the choreographer that was against us, which was contrary to us, is taken out of the way. It is removed from Talmisu, which is in the middle, the middle of the courtroom occupied by the accuser. Then it is nailed to the cross like a banner proclaiming Messiah's triumph over sin on our behalf. Amen. Hold on a second. By paying the penalty for our sins, Yeshua spoiled the adversary's plan to condemn us with a choreographer. That is why the very next verse says, and having spoiled principalities, this is in Colossians 2.15, the very next verse, says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah and amen to that one again. You know, um, I did a teaching a few months back on Yeshua, 
And when I was reading this, that, that verse there in Colossians, I was like, you know what? It reminds me of the times where, again, it's kind of going a little bit back to the sermon I did before, where we have this depiction of Yeshua as this gentle lamb, this kind of really, I won't say a sissy guy, but a guy who isn't very masculine, let's put it that way. Lamp, holding the lamb and just, you know, doesn't say anything offensive, doesn't do anything wrong. And then I'm like, you know what? That's not the Yeshua I read. The Yeshua I read about, even though they're coming for his life in John chapter 7, he still shows up, goes to the goes to the uh, tabernacle, still goes in there and preaches the word like nobody else has heard. This is the same guy who's walking amongst the people knowing that they want to kill him. He's like, hey, it's not my time. You're not going to do anything to me. This is the same guy, the same Savior that is out there when he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Because it's already out there that he's Elijah return. He's one of the prophets. He's this, he's that. Then they say, who do you say that I am? They said, you're the son of the living God. He's asking this question because everyone has a perception of him and who he is. But towards the end of his ministry, what do we see? We see him standing there at the uh, at near the opening of what they call Sheol then, or Gehe, or um, what was it called? It's like Gehagen, but that's a place here in Somerville. Gehenna. Gehenna, that's it. He's standing over by Gehenna, and not only he's standing by Gehenna, but he's also standing by the by the where the temple of Pan is, the god Pan, and he's saying to them, "Now, who do you say I am?" Because he's letting all these other guys know these aren't just made up deities. This isn't, this isn't just made up mythology. There really are other Elohim that the Father a long time ago placed over the nations to watch over them. And then the, the people started worshiping them as gods. And I think before he leaves here, he makes a declaration of who he is. When he walks on the water, he's making a declaration because Baal was God of the water. There's other and there's other deities that were God over the water. So when he walks over the water, he's making I, my heart. He's making declarations like, no, no, no. I know what you all think, and I know what goes around in this area. He says, but I'm going to show you who I am. I'm the King of Kings. I am the Messiah of all, and I will tread over this. I will walk over this. I will show you. Oh, by the way, the other God that's over the weather and all that stuff. Hey, when I get to the boat and everything's rocking and I speak the word, it's all going to stop. Why? Because I'm making a declaration of who I am. When I show up to the man who's got the legion of demons in him, after everything else has happened, after the calming of the waters, walking on the water, everything that's going on, I'm going to show everyone else that, hey, I'm also king over this. So the Yeshua that I serve isn't just calm guy, just lay back kind of hippie looking or whatever, he was in the face of it. If there was any other gods or any of these, what we call the lower KC yellow in that area, he's letting them know, hey, I'm the man before he leaves. He's letting everybody else know also, I'm the man. When he goes to the cross, it isn't to abolish his father's ways. He says, I came here because I'm going to do something that no other Elohim can do. All these other little El Elohims out there, they cannot do what I do. I rule over them the same as the Father showed us in Egypt over all the other plagues that were out there. And he sent, he was showing that I am the L of all these other L's that you've been worshiping. I'm going to make a statement now, and they're going to know it, and everybody else throughout the rest of history is going to know it as well. He was emulating his Father. He says, I only do what the Father has shown me to do. So the last thing that Yeshua was going to do is show up on the scene and go, hey, don't worry about it. I got you guys. I know you've been, I know you've been wanting to know what all these different foods taste like. Don't worry about it. I got you. And I know how much of a burden it is for you to do Sukkot every year in a camp and have a good time. It's such a burden. Oh, I don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of all that for you. Now, and by the way, you're going to be celebrating other, other holidays down the road. Don't worry about it. I got you. Got you. The removal of the Keogrophon is something entirely different from what the erroneous assumption that Yeshua or Yahuwah's law got nailed to the cross. The word law, Greek nomos, does not even appear anywhere in the entire book of Colossians, by the way. There we go. 
neither in the Greek text nor in the, the KJV translation. Whoa. Uh, it says, uh, of course, Yahuwah's commandments are alluded to in conjunction with the Kyogrophon, Toas Dogmason of ordinances. Because in order to accuse us, the adversary obviously has to list which commandments, ordinances we broke. So he knows them. I'll be honest with you. Hasatan knows it as well as any of us. Matter of fact, probably better. <laughs> okay. But it is not, but it is not the commandments of the law which are removed. Rather, it is the written record of our law breaking that is removed from the courtroom. Hallelujah. Understand the choreographer as a legal record of a person's sin can be seen not only in the Gentile, or I'm sorry, Gentile, yeah, only in the Gentile Greek literature, but in Jewish Greek literature as well. The Greek text of the apocryphal book, uh, the Apocalypse of Elijah, describes an angel holding a book that is called a choreographer. Let me see if I can find this one real quick so I can finish. Uh, Let's see if I can find that. Looks like a finished reading it. Uh, yeah, here we go. All right. The book is called Crayographon, and it and it contains the records, the record of sins. I'm gonna read that all the way through again, so it's not choppy. The Apocalypse of Elijah describes an angel holding a book. The book is called a Crayographon, and it contains the record of sins. The traditional Jewish Avino Mekinu uh, prayer likewise paints a similar picture. This prayer is in Hebrew, so it is obviously cannot use the Greek word kerogaphon. However, it describes a scenario similar to Colossians 2.14 when it asks God to erase all documents that accuse us. Yahuwah does, not, does more than erase all the documents that, that accuse us. If Yahuwah merely erased the record of our sins, the adversary could point to the smudge choreographer and say that someone tampered with the evidence. So Yahuwah does something even better than just erase than just erasing the record of our sins. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought it said. I was gonna make sure. Yahuwah takes the choreographer and removes it from the courtroom, leaving the accuser empty-handed with absolutely no evidence to condemn us. With no power to punish us, the choreographer is nailed to the cross like a banner to declare our victory. Hallelujah. Thus, the instrument that Satan intended for evil, Yahuwah uses for good. Amen. Yahuwah nailed the choreographer to the cross, verse 14, and there, thereby spoiled the principalities and powers, making a show of them openly and triumphing over them. My final thoughts on this. So don't think because I'm at 33 minutes, my final thoughts are going to be short either. <laughs> you like to think so. Anyway, let's look at this. So what I want to do is I want to um, actually what I want to I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this first. It's going to be a small part of the excerpt uh, from Mr. Daniel uh, Botkin. And I want to, and, I, and please listen carefully to what I'm saying. And this again, this isn't, uh, this isn't a slam on any particular group of people. This is all. Whenever you hear me speak about uh, Catholicism or Judaism, it's about the system. It's never about going after people. Okay, the systems. There's, 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 you know, the beast system, the beast system that's out there now. It's, we're not waiting for it to show up. It's it's been here from for a really long time. Matter of fact, uh, Yeshua Himself says the spirit of Antichrist is already here. It's just that we're in a particular time and place uh, where um, it's becoming more predominant. It's like you it's in your face all the time. And no, we haven't got to the point yet where we're asked to take a you know something upon our foreheads or our hands yet. Um, I hope that yeah. Anyway, hope we all pass that test if we live long enough to see it. So what I want to do is I want to read this for you. Uh, it's not very long, but here it goes. It says, the Orthodox Judaism of today evolved from the Judaism of the Pharisees. Everything that we read in the New Testament, you know, 
they were after Yeshua all the time. They tried using the word, they lost every time. They would try to lay hands on him, they lose every time, until it was the Father's time for that to happen. So again, I'm not attacking uh, uh, Brother Yehuda, I'm not attacking any individuals, but, but what I'm going to speak about is the system here. So it says, the Orthodox Judaism of today evolved from the Judaism of the, excuse me, the Pharisees, and it still retains some of the leaven of the Pharisees. Why do the Pharisees of old, modern day rabbis, expect Jews to abide by hundreds of rabbinical rulings that prescribe exactly how to keep the Sabbath and all the rest of Torah? The rabbis prescribe how to keep the Sabbath in such great detail that a person never has to be led by the Spirit. I thought that was pretty powerful to say. Let me read that again. The rabbis prescribed how to keep the Sabbath in such a great detail that a person never has to be led by the Spirit. Theoretically, he will never uh, never find himself in a situation where he has to hear from God and make his own decision about how to obey the Torah. <clears throat> Excuse me. The rabbis have already prescribed every detail. They even have man-made laws that govern bug killing on the Sabbath. I didn't know that before. I was like, bug killing? You didn't kill a bug? My wife doesn't like that one. Oh, sorry, but you gotta let her live. <laughs> Catch and release. <laughs> they tell Jews which kind of bugs can be killed and under which circumstances these bugs can be killed. If you happen to kill the wrong kind of bug or you kill the right kind of bug under, uh, bug under circumstances that the rabbis have not authorized, then you have violated the Sabbath according to their view. This is just one of the many examples of doctrines and commandments of men that put God's people in bondage. God's unadulterated law does not put people in bondage. Amen. It liberates. So shall I keep the law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty. Psalms 119, verse 44. God wants us to keep his commandments, but we can dis, uh, disregard man-made commandments that men have added to God's commandments. Adding to the commandments of God, as the rabbis do and the Pharisees did, and some teachers at, at Colossae did, perverts the law and turns it into a yoke, a heavy burden, which neither our father nor we were able to bear, Acts 5, 15, or Acts 15, 10. In contrast, this is man-imposed yoke. Yeshua says, take my yoke upon you and learn, for, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Yeshua does not say that the yoke of Torah is nailed to the cross and abolished. He only says that his teaching of Torah is light compared to that of the Pharisees, who taught a Torah weighed down with additional excessive man-made demands. Then immediately after Yeshua's statement about his light yoke, the very next verse begins a story that demonstrates the contrast between the Pharisees' yoke and Yeshua's yoke. The Pharisees' interpretation of Torah would condemn the hungry disciples for plucking and eating a bit of grain as they walk through the field on the Sabbath. Yeshua's yoke would permit a hungry disciple to do what they did in those circumstances. Just as David and his hungry men were permitted to eat the pre-show bread in their unusual circumstances. Unusual circumstances mean uh, David was on the run. Saul was trying to kill you. <laughs> you know, he's literally on the lamb. He's, he's, he's doing the best he can. And this is in the past, the first time I ever did this, I had Jonathan come up and read this next part. Do you remember? About the Jewish grandmother? Oh, yeah. yeah, I wasn't going to ask you to do it again, but yeah, he's like, nah. <laughs> this is a funny part in the story that he wrote, but it says, as a Jewish grandmother once remarked about the disciples plucking grain on the Sabbath, you mean these hungry Jewish boys with no place to eat on Shabbat? Why, did those Pharise why didn't those Pharisees invite them to dinner instead of scolding them? Would have been the better option, right? Hey, you guys are hungry? Man, come on over. I got a big old bowl of stew or a big old pot of stew over here, man. Come on and eat. It says the Gregor Fund, the record of law breaking has been taken out of the courtroom and nailed to the cross because Yeshua paid the penalty for our law breaking. But this does not give us the right to return to a life, <laughs> okay, of lawlessness or law breaking. It says, as Yeshua said to the woman taken in adultery, so he says to us, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. John 8, 11. Amen.
So I, I, um, the very first time I heard this was uh, probably over three years ago, I guess, Jonathan, right? And uh, I taught on it then, and I wanted to do it again, especially um, um, in lieu of we talk about the Sabbath and how many different ways it feels like the people within the body of Messiah want to find an excuse not to keep it. They want to find an excuse not to eat um, clean. They want to find an excuse not to keep uh, his holy days. They want to find an excuse for everything they absolutely can. And really what it boils down to, let's be honest, we're all selfish. I'm going to throw myself, we're all selfish in our own way. And it's not easy sometimes as we, we get in our brains that, hey, I could do whatever I want to. I'm covered under grace and all these things. Yeah, they're done away with. Or we'll say those are just for the Jews. Let me say, ladies and gentlemen, the Father's feast days, his Sabbath, his Sabbaths, there's more than one, um, all of his instructions to us. And I like the word instruction better than I like law. Law seems to come with a negative connotation. It sounds like a law, you know. But really what it is is the Father's instructions for his children. Why would we want to keep the things that God says, if you keep these, you'll be blessed. Again, today, when we were doing our Torah study, we were talking about, I brought up about Esau and Jacob. Jacob was a good guy. Jacob was a very good guy who honored his parents. He was blessed, man. By the time we get to the, to the, 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 the heart of the story of Jacob, man, he's rolling deep. He's got money. He's got People, he's got, I, would probably, I mean, he's got everything. He's got animals. He's got all of it. There's a blessing that comes with keeping the father's ways. Esau, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to marry who I want. You're not going to tell me what to do. God's, I'm not keeping that. Oh, I'm supposed to be the next guy in line to be whatever for the family, to be the patriarch because I'm technically the oldest. Forget about it. I'll sell it for a bowl of little soup. Everything that Esau did was exactly, I feel like, what the church is teaching us to do today. It's disregard everything that's important to our Heavenly Father. And I know that there's a popular saying out there that goes, blessed and highly favored. What it is, is I think there's an abundance of grace right now poured out on our ignorance is what it is. And God realizes, hey, I know they're doing the best they can. I know there's been a lot of things. The water is so muddy right now. But we are in a place, ladies and gentlemen, where the Father is speaking to the body of those who have ears to hear and a spirit to receive what the Holy Spirit has to say. He is drawing his his set of parts out from this world. And you have to make it up. You have to make a decision in your heart. Am I willing to take that journey with my heavenly father? Am I willing to come out of Babylon? Am I willing to take those steps that, that means that it might make me feel uncomfortable or might mean that my family looks, like, looks at me like I'm crazy or whatever it might be? And the answer to that is yes. The answer to it is yes. You know, the Bible says to gain your life is to lose, to lose your life is to gain. You have to make that decision for yourself and how, and what you, and how you want to go about and how you want to walk out your salvation walk. And the thing that I, that I would implore you to do is go read the scriptures. Go read them and ask the Father through the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't mean that God doesn't use teachers in our lives. He absolutely does. But at some point, you have to start reading it for yourself. Because if you don't, those who are ignorant, those who are untrained, will teach you things that are not in God's word and twist the truth of all of it. Amen? So we got to be a lot more, do, do, put more due diligence into reading for yourself. And there's nothing wrong with getting with other, other brothers and sisters and saying, hey, I need some help in this. And I believe collectively, the, the, the Bible says there are two or more gathered there is in the midst of us. And I truly believe that through that, like when we sit at the table, uh, we do our Bible study, man, it just flows sometimes. Sometimes it's just like, it's just, and I would say the majority of the time it flows. And if it doesn't feel like it's flowing, it's probably because I'm just having an off day or Jonathan or whoever might be having. But guess what? When I realize the Holy Spirit's still moving regardless of how I feel. <laughs> That's the beautiful part of that. I love it. All right. So I'm going to wrap this up by kind of going back. because so this is a new thing to you, I'm going to kind of go back and just put a bow on this for you, okay? 
and uh, go back and read from the beginning. It says the term choreographon is a Greek word used in the New Testament, particularly in Colossians 2.14. It means handwriting or written record. In ancient times, a choreographon was a handwritten document often used as a legal or financial instrument, such as a, such as a certificate of debt or a bond. And we know that what Yeshua did for us is he canceled all of our debt, period. Period. It's all of our debts been canceled. And so Paul is writing in such a way that we would understand the time that he was written in. Those Greeks all over the place. <laughs> He's going to use terms that people living in a Greek society, dominated society, are going to understand. There to them, it wasn't even it wasn't even close. They didn't they wasn't even it wasn't even like they went, oh, he's talking about the law of God. No. They would have absolutely understood this word and where he was going with the, the legal ramifications of the care of him. Wasn't even a second thought. In context of Colossians 2.14, Paul uses Kyogrophon metaphorically to refer to the record of debt or the legal demands that stood against humanity due to sin. By nailing this, our debt, okay, to the cross, Yeshua is said to have canceled the debt of sin, symbolizing the forgiveness and reconciliation offered through his sacrifice. And he was not sacrificed like an animal. Let me say it. He laid down his life. No one took it from him. So here we go. It says, did Yeshua abolish the Sabbath? No. It says, this day of rest, Yeshua says, is made for humans. Mark 2, 27. Yeshua claims himself as master of the Sabbath. This mastership does not abolish the Sabbath. For why would Yeshua abolish something over which he himself is ruler, but instead he reinforces it? I almost feel like that should be a big old common sense, like some kind of symbol, like a stamp, like boom. Well, see, he's the master of the Shabbat, so he's our rest now. No, yeah, he's the master of it. He was there at the beginning when it was created. He was there when we were created. That's what I said in my last sermon. So why is he abolishing something? He says, but I made it for you. I made this, me and my father made this for you. Not to be abolished down the road, not to do whatever day you felt like is right to you, not to just pick out, oh, today's Tuesday, I think I'll, the day will be my Sabbath. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, it might be a Sabbath rest to you, but it is not the Sabbath to the Father. Woo. So all being said, guys, keep seeking. God, growing in faith and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you to his image, into the image of Christ. Amen. Remember, challenges refine our faith and draw us closer to God. We're not alone. The Holy Spirit empowers us. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, and let us consider how, how we may spur one another on, spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another um, and all the more as you see the day approaching, the day of what? The day of his return. Let me just say this. Uh, sometimes what that looks like when we spur one another on to good works may look like to other people as people in conflict or arguing, arguing, <laughs> say the word right. It may look like, um, Tension. It may look like I don't know. I don't know the words to put in there, but you know what I'm saying. If you've been in this walk long enough, you know that when when it, let's I'll just throw it out there because it's been the hot the hot ticket for a while now is a calendar. You know when we've had conversations online with other people, and what we're trying to do is share the information as the Father gives it to us. And it does get kicked back. It does get like, now nah, we, we, that's not for us. Or, you know, there seems to be this tension. I'm going to tell you right now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that tension as long as it's all done in love. Now, if it gets into name calling, if it gets into you're dumb, if it gets into whatever it's not supposed to be, that's different. But we're to spur one another on to good works. And sometimes it's not going to look pretty. 
And other people will comment and say, well, see, this is why I don't like being a part of whatever, or I don't like being on here because this causes conflict, causes division. My God, if you don't have some something going on that's, that's, that's challenging us, then what do we have? If we're not challenging one another in God's word, then what do we have? Are we just getting together to have just a feel good group? Is that what it's is that what it's all about? Is we're just all gonna feel good together? Because here's the deal. I, I see things a certain way. You may see them another way at the end of the day. I'm gonna stick with the way I see it, unless the father changes that. But unless we have that adult conversation, unless we can come to the table with one another and have an adult conversation about it, that might be a little bit heated. It might get some people's what they call the, the term get your feathers rustled. It might that or ruffled, that's what it's ruffled. Um it might happen, and that might be the best thing that ever happened to you. Because at the end of the day, the father, Yeshua even said, be angry, but don't sin. It's okay. You're like, man, I can't believe they told me this. I can't believe blah, blah, blah. It's okay. Have your moment. Stew in your moment for a minute, but then come back to the table. Because if we keep saying that, if we keep using the term when Jesus gets back or Yeshua gets back, it's all going to be fine, well, and done. We can't keep using that as a fallback to not pursuing forward and what the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to the body. Because too many times, that, that's 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 the, I'm, I'm tapping out. Well, it doesn't matter. It's not a salvation issue anyway. Oh, it doesn't matter because when he gets back, he's going to, yes. Hallelujah. Many times when Yeshua shows back up on the scene, it will be a tight running ship for sure. There is not going to be anything out of order as far as his kingdom goes that the Father has given him. Absolutely. But if you think for one minute that we cannot hear as a collective body from the Holy Spirit to lead us in the ways of our Heavenly Father to get closer to where the water is clear and get out of the mud, you're, not, you're highly mistaken. And when things get a little bit tight and get a little bit tense and the first thing you want to do is tap out and go and take your tour and go home, well, that's on you. And maybe sometimes we do need to believe. My dad you has an old saying. Sometimes we got to back up, regroup, and maintain. So if you feel like you're about to lose it on something, you feel like you're about to say words you shouldn't say, or you're just, uh, I'm ready to tear the whole place down. Yeah, the back up, take some deep breaths, back up, regroup, and maintain. But the reason why I bring these teachings the way I do is because I want you to share them out. I want you to share them with your family, your loved ones. I want you to share it with people who are still walking in darkness. I want you to share it with your pastor out there who's still teaching that Christ did away with the commandments. And me and Jonathan both have both said, we don't mind sitting down with anyone's pastor in person or on the phone or whatever it might be a Zoom. Now that we have Zoom is like the main thing now. We don't mind having these conversations in love. We don't mind sitting at the big boy table and having this discussion with other pastors because um, I, what I really hope is that the Holy Spirit just, man, just drops and the truth is revealed. Because this false teaching has been out there for a really long time. Now, I'm not going to do like other pastors will say, well, hell is filling up because people do this. And hell is filling up because of this over here. I'm not saying anybody's going to hell because you don't keep the Sabbath. If, you're, if there's no understanding in your brain about what the true Sabbath is, my Heavenly Father that I serve, I know is a just judge and if you truly do know knew nothing about whatever it was paul even said i wouldn't have known what sin was until i read the torah i didn't know how can god hold you how can you hold your child to something to something that they, they looked at you and said dad i didn't know and then you as a parent to go you know what that was my bad son i didn't i didn't tell you exactly when to be home i didn't tell you exactly. i thought that you'd have better judgment i'll come home at four in the morning but i didn't you know, from now on, son, it's 11 o'clock. That's your curfew. You understand? So now that ordinance to 11 goes. And guess what? When the son's 30 years old, that ordinance never changed. Now, it changed for him because he's outside of that of having to come home. He's a grown man on his own, hopefully, not living in your basement playing video games. <laughs> but here's the thing was we think, you know, God's commandments are all done away with. Here's the, here's the deal with it. A lot of the commandments that we are given of the supposedly was a 619, Jonathan, right? 619, right? Something like that. Something like that, right? The majority of them are not applicable to me because I'm not a judge. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a woman. <laughs> I'm not a lot of different things. 
There's a lot of things that we have to realize, but because I am not these things does not make these any less than what they were when they were originally written. Honor your mother and father. Jacob is how old when it says that he honored his mother and father? At least 40s, 50s, somewhere in there. It wasn't like, hey, I'm 50 years old. I'm a grown man. And guess what, mom? Pick bricks. I'm going to do what I want to. No, it says at that age, he's, he honored his mother and father. Doesn't matter how old you are. You always honor your mother and father. Let me say that. You, might not agree. you may not agree. Like I said, you may not agree, but you still need to honor your mother and father. So when, we, when I bring this teaching to you, and I want to, I want to share with you that this is not, this is not the Torah that everyone, or I say everyone, a lot of people say, oh, see, nailed to the cross, gone away with, he just, he just did, it. he abolished it, he did all these things, and what we're doing is we're taking the word of God out of context of what it's really saying, and that's why we need to have these grown-up conversations. We need to come to the table, and we need to pull out scripture, and we need to allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide. And to lead us in these discussions. And if it gets heated, it gets heated. It's okay. You know, one of the things that we talk about the um, um, if you've ever seen a midrash with the rabbis or with people, uh, uh, Brother Judah, you'd think that they were mortal enemies. I've seen some midrashes where they were like just everybody's kind of there. They're over there reading the Torah and they're they're having their moment. And right after that, they're all having tea and lockers, man. I'm like, hey, everything's good. Hey, right, hey, we're good. They were passionate about the word and what they felt like it was being said. And guess what? At the very end of it, they're all cool with each other. They're like, yeah, I'll be at your house tomorrow for Shabbat. We're cool. You know? And we need to learn to have those conversations, even if it gets heated, to say, you know what? I love you. Person says back, I love you. Let's let's continue this walk together. Amen. So let's go ahead and wrap it up. Or as my friend Nick would say, that's all right. <laughs> we need to connect, grow, and make meaningful memories. Amen. Do it the best you can. If it's online, for now, so be it. It's online. It's okay. It is okay. Absolutely. But that's all you have. We love having you. I say it every week. We love having you here in person. And we love having you online to be with us. And don't forget this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 through 23, it says, in all circumstances, give thanks for this is the desire of Elohim and Messiah Yeshua for you. For you, okay? Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Prove them all, hold fast to what is good, keep back from every form of wickedness. And the Elohim of peace himself sets you completely apart in your entire spirit and being and body be preserved, blameless at the coming of our Master Yeshua Messiah. Amen. And in Jude uh, 1, 24 through 25, it says, Now to the one who can keep you from falling and set you without defect and full of joy. That's different from happiness, ladies and gentlemen. Go back to Anchor to Truth. We did a study on this. Fruit of Spirit. We still got to finish that. <laughs> Kyle, we got to finish Fruit of Spirit. <laughs> Been two years, brother. <laughs> Our fruit's starting to look, uh, it's, it's looking rotten on the table. It's not, it's not, it's over right. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's very mature right now. <laughs> Full of joy in the presence of his glory. To God alone, our deliverer, through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. So, Father, I thank you for everyone that's joined us online. I thank you for the, those who could be with us today in person. And, Father, I pray as, as we go through this series of the case for the Sabbath, the biblical Sabbath, that I'll let your Holy Spirit continue to pour into me, to pour into these messages, to pour into the people who hear these messages. Father, for there be an awakening in your in your in the in the body of Messiah. Because Father, I believe that revival begins with your word, not from our feelings, not from an experience, not from a whatever. I think true revival is your word that is alive and active, that brings life into us. So, Father, I pray that your word will continue to go forth, never, ever return void. Father, I thank you for what you've begun and what you're going to complete and all your set of parts. Father, um, regardless of what's coming, what's going to happen, uh, and all those things in this world, 
Father, we just give you the honor, glory, and praise that you deserve every day because every day, Father, belongs to you. Though the enemy will claim days for themselves, they will set dates for themselves. They will plan things. They will do things in the name of whatever it is they're doing, Father. But every day that that sun comes around, it is your day. It is the day that you have made. And Abba, may all your set of hearts rejoice in that day. Until the very day that if we live long enough to see our Messiah return. Hallelujah. And Father, may you, may you, Father, continue to be glorified in all that we do. And we just love you, praise you for all that you've done. In Yeshua's name we pray. And Father, I lift up everyone that's online with us right now in person. For Ryan's uh, son, Asen, and everyone who's just, that bug's been going around, the flu, whatever it is, stomach viruses, Father, we just ask that you would just uh, j um, make our immune system just, just get stronger. Father, I pray a blessing over all of our immune systems just to uh, get all that stuff out, help us to take the right supplements, uh, drink the right teas, whatever it is, Father, that you gave us from the very beginning, your natural recipes, uh, Father, to fight off all these things. Father, may, may you give us wisdom in all of that, Father, your blessings over Ecclesia, Father. In Yeshua's name again, we pray all these things. Amen. All right, guys. I love every one of you. Thank you for being here with us um, at Divine. And I pray that this has been a blessing to you. I pray that it's uh, this is something that you feel like, you know, that you would want to share out with others and maybe share with some pastor friends or whatever it is. I just pray this message is a blessing. And if you went by right now, if everybody, we got 22 people right now showing online. If you haven't hit the like button yet, if you could hit that like button, that would help the algorithms uh, for the Vine. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe if you like to. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. But uh, again, we, we uh, love you. And uh, Shabbat Shalom to everyone. And we will see everyone really soon. Shalom.